Happy Friday, everybody. Good to be with you. I'm David Burns, and Friday means I'm going to answer your questions. Not all of them, but some of the ones that you've been asking me on my YouTube channel. Some very good questions, and we've got some show-and-tell items. I'm going to test you on whether you know what all of these items are, and so pay close attention. And then I've got some special things to show you about getting ready for spring, how to get your frames pulled out a little bit faster. Lots to deal with today. Jump right into it. Question number one, can you split one hive into three? I imagine it would work if you have queen cells in the two without a queen and resources to get them started. Yeah, that is correct. If your hives are populated enough in the spring and you've got the queen cells, you've got some way to get mated queens or something, and, um, and you can sacrifice that many bees, absolutely, you can do it. Um, usually I split my hives twice, like make two splits out of a real strong colony, and then I'll wait a month and split it again two more times. And that's what works for me. Next question, hi David. Question, when I put out the one-to-one -one sugar water, do I need to pull my honey supers off first that I left on for the winter? First time making it until the spring. Well, good, congratulations making it. The question is, when you're feeding your bees in the spring, like I'm gonna be doing here in just a few days, I wanna, I wanna feed them one-to-one -one sugar water with our feeding additive pack, uh, and that way I can get my bees built up a little bit better with foragers before the first spring honey flow. And so, yeah, um, so the question is, should you leave that honey super on? Um, you can, but just be aware that if you start feeding them, they might start putting what you're feeding them in that honey super. And so what I usually do is try to take that off when I'm feeding them, or I just dedicate one super to be their super forevermore. In other words, I'm never gonna harvest honey out of that extra super on top. That's just an extra place for them to always use as a honey super resource. So you can make that decision. But yeah, if that's gonna be honey you're gonna eat or gonna sell, uh, let's try to keep it where it's just uh, floral source honey rather than sugar water honey. Good question. Um, another question, why do you not like inner covers? Now the inner cover goes between your top box and just underneath your telescoping or migratory top cover. I don't know. It's not that I don't like them. I find them, I, I found them many years ago. It's just an unnecessary thing. There are benefits to an inner cover. An inner cover can cause a little bit of vapor barrier uh, between the outside of the hive. I need that mostly in the winter time. And, I, and so I feed my bees my winter bee kinds that take that place. And then um, sometimes you think in the summertime, it might create a little uh, more space for air to vaporize or kind of uh, leave the hive. I just stick a little stick or a quarter under my top cover, jack it up a little bit. Um, so it was just a long time ago, I made a decision. It was one unnecessary piece of, of equipment that I needed to fool with. Now you don't see them on migratory lids. You see uh, many commercial beekeepers, they run uh, deep boxes and then they just have the migratory lid on top of that. And so it has its benefits. So if you, it's kind of the, I'm on the fence with it. If you use it, if you love it and you enjoy the, the, the benefits that, that it brings, uh, good. If, if you can live without it, good. Another benefit that a lot of people say is that it keeps the top cover from sticking to the box. Like if you don't have the inner cover there, it's hard to get the top cover off. And uh, I guess that could be true, although in my case, the inner cover just is stuck to the box. So I'm not sure about that. I don't really have a hard, fast rule. Like I'm not gonna be able to say my bees do much better without an inner cover. It's just one less piece of equipment that I don't have to fool with. Another question, um, have a question. Why do queens die? I've never been asked that question. Most people know why things die. They, they just get old and die. Queens usually die from, um, Usually they, they get too old. All queens on their mating flight, they mate with upwards of 20 different drones on one mating flight and they fly back to the hive. They have all the sperm from those drones that they store in their organ called a spermatheca. They store it there their whole life. And so what happens is eventually as the queen fertilizes each egg that she lays, you can imagine 2000 eggs a day, that she is likely to run out of sperm after a couple of years. And so once she runs out of sperm, she won't take another mating flight. And so at that point, they're going to supersede her. And so it's usually the hive that gets rid of her. It's not so much that she's dying from a problem. She just ran out of stored sperm, delayed fertilized egg, which are workers. For unfertilized eggs are drone, the male drones who don't do any work other than mate with virgin queens. Next question. After watching your videos, I see that you have many beautiful hives. Would you suggest the honey flow for a novice, the honey flow. 
Um, the honey flow, the flow hive. I wonder if you are referring to the flow hive. Let's, uh, would you suggest the honey flow for a novice? I'm going to assume you mean um, the flow hive. And so the flow hive, I've, you've heard me say on my videos that I think everybody should start with a Langstroth hive and the flow hive is a Langstroth hive. It just has a modified super that makes it so you can turn a crank when the honey is ready to be harvested and then it flows out through a spigot into your jar. You don't have to remove this, the honey frames and you know uncap them and spin them and all that. And so I think it's fine to start with a flow hive. I really do. Um, because I just remember, you'd still have to inspect your colony. You have to work it the same way. You have to control mites. You still have to give more boxes for it to expand into. So don't think just by turning a crank on a hive that you don't have to do all the other necessary things. The whole the Flow Hive company, uh, since I bought one, they they don't recommend that it's hand off hands off. They they're, they're very good about explaining that you still have to manage it. They give some good management techniques. So I think it could be fine for a beginner if that's what you want to do. They are more expensive than the traditional Langstroth box. That's because you're not getting the uh, crank and harvest uh, frames up above on a traditional Langstroth hive. Uh, next question, David, when do you start queen rearing? I live in northern Michigan. Well, I, I'd like to start right now, but my weather's too cold still. Today, it's Friday. It is, uh, let's see, March the 8th. So, you know, still a little too cold outside. We've have gotten we've gotten snows in March. But I would say toward the end of April, I won't be able to stand it anymore, and I'll have to start raising queens. Usually when my dandelions start uh, blooming pretty, pretty steadily, I'll start uh, raising queens. It's all about the timing of your mated drones, your mature drones. Uh, I shouldn't say mated drones, but when your uh, drones are mature, you can see them flying, taking mating flights. Uh, then you're like, okay, so the best time ever, make a little note here, lean forward, listen closely, big tip coming right here for you to, those of you wanting to raise queens. The best time to raise queens is when your bees do it naturally, wherever you live. It doesn't matter where I live compared to where you live. It just matters where you live when your bees start raising queens naturally, swarm season, for example, whenever that happens in where you live, that's the best time to raise queens because that's when the bees are doing it. That's a good question. Um, how do you do classes at, oh, wait a minute. How do you do classes at your place or online? If you do classes at your place, is there a campground nearby? We used to do classes here, taught many classes at our training center. COVID knocked that out. Since then, and even before then, we had online courses. We still do offer online courses. To us, I know that a lot of you feel like uh, in-person classes are good. Some of you would rather take online courses. I prefer online courses uh, because I think you can always pause it, replay it, work through it again. Sometimes you go to an in-person class, you may not take good notes. It, it costs money to drive. Uh, the gas money is, gas is going up again. Hotel expenses are skyrocketing. Meals are skyrocketing. Um, the time commitment of travel uh, to my place and taking a class here, there's a lot more expenses to it. So to me, the online course allows you to have the training in your hands forever. The videos you can watch forever. You don't have to pay all the expenses. You don't have to fight a crowd of people to get your question answered. If you go to the bathroom, you'll miss out on something I said. <laughs> I don't know. It just has a lot of benefits. So it's very unlikely that uh, we will ever have in-person classes since so many people do enjoy our online courses. I'll leave a link right here to our online courses as well. And let's continue to go through our questions on Question Friday. Friday, I always like to answer some of your questions. Here we go on page two. David, are you saying three mites per 100 equals nine mites per three uh, B test? Just want to make sure, just want to make this clear in my own mind. Thanks. Uh, that, that's correct. Um, we use one half cup of bees to do a mite wash, an alcohol wash um, on, on the bees to get the mites off. A half a cup equals 300 bees. And so we want to see less than three mites per 100 bees that are sampled. We take a larger sample to kind of make it average out more accurately. I guess that's a good way to say it. So by taking 300 bees, and sampling those, you're just dividing the mites down by three. And that gives you your infestation level, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Good question. Um, don't have bees yet. I have a few, a few feral hives in the neighborhood. Hoping to catch a swarm to get started. How would I approach my control on a fresh new swarm? 
Good question. A fresh new swarm is going to have mites because they came out of an established colony that has mites. So mites are exo uh, parasites. They're on the external uh, parts of the bees walking around. And so they are on that swarm. And so as soon as you uh, hive the swarm, then, and they start to raise more brood, you're going to have more mites. So I would suggest catching the swarm. And then what you want to do is wait until they get kind of built up. I would probably wait a couple of three weeks, get, get at least one generation of bees. After 21 days, they start, uh, the queen starts laying. And after 21 days, the workers will emerge from that first day she started laying. And then you're going to have more bees because sampling bees, you're going to uh, kill 300 bees on a mite test. So always test, treat, and test. So don't really approach um, treating your mites until you test to see if you have a problem. If you're below three mites per 100, you might want to wait and sample again in 30 days. Good question. Is there such a thing as a list of make hive makers? No imports from China. Oh, there, I don't know of any list of hive makers other than going to Google and typing in hives for sale. There are companies here in the U.S. that looks like what you're looking for. But I'll tell you this, uh, there used to be just a few big companies when I started out, um, beekeeping companies. But now companies are uh, just small mom and pop shops are popping up everywhere. I mean, wow, it's crazy. Now, not everyone makes their own hive equipment. A lot of people that run beekeeping supply stores, especially smaller ones, are buying their equipment somewhere else and reselling it to you. And I'm not going to say that I would hope they're all American boxes if that's what you're looking for. But if not, it's possible that some people could be getting these things from other countries. If you're against that, then I would just uh, encourage you to ask the owner if things are made in the U.S., if that's what you're looking for. But yeah, there's no list that I know of. Uh, next question, what's the best kind of flowers for good honey? Ooh, that's a good one. It depends on what you call good honey. I like uh, orange blossom honey. And of course, that comes from the orange tree blossom. So, um, but I don't live near orange trees here in Illinois. We did have an orange tree once. It survived a few years in a pot that we kept taking inside and outside during the winter and all. Uh, the orange tree finally died. We did get a few oranges off of it but it didn't taste good. <laughs> All that work and waiting. Um, you can go to the grocery store and get a delicious orange. My orange wasn't that good. But of course, I've been to Florida with bees and all, and those oranges there, those orange trees, oranges are great. Um, so if you like, I, I got to say though, since I don't have orange blossom readily available, you can always send me some. If you live in that area, people send me gifts. I'll, I'll take your gift of a jar of orange blossom honey. But um, I guess clover honey is my favorite because that's what we have in Illinois. We have a lot of clover. And so the Dutch clover, yard clover, the white little short clover is what I'm talking about. It makes delicious honey. Last question, then we're going to get into some of the stuff up here. Show and tell Friday. Um, hi, David. I had only one hive survive winter and so far looks good, but can't afford a swarm. I will try this method, but how would you suggest I make another hive with so little resources? Hope this made sense. Oh, this was a comment left on my Demaray um, swarm control method. I gave I, I gave a good talk, a good uh, presentation video on how to use the Demaray swarm control method. I'll leave a link in the description to that video. So many of you have liked that so much. Uh, I'm going to be answering questions on that in Reddit uh, in a few, I think a few months too. Um, People in the UK have really enjoyed that video. And so it's amazing. And in the US as well. Um, so to answer your question, can't afford a swarm. Maybe you're going to try the Demaray method to control swarm. I get this question asked. I got it asked last night in my live stream. Our live stream is so fun. We're going to have another live stream uh, coming up this Thursday. And it's going to be about various swarm control methods and various swarm techniques, swarm prevention or methods to make splits, for example. That's coming up in my next live stream. So I'll leave a link to that live stream right here. This is going to be a good one for you to watch so you can weigh out all the different ways to make a split or swarm control. Um, but it's going to be tough to stop reproduction. That's what you're trying to do. Bees naturally reproduce. And when you try to stop that, they're going to find a way to do it. So it's going to be really tough. I think sometimes I think we could put a queen excluder between the bottom board and that and the next deep above the bottom board. And that way the swarm queen can never leave the hive. And so even if the swarm left, they likely would go back in and go, hey, mom, what happened? We swarmed and you didn't come with us. I couldn't fit through the queen excluder. What do we do now? Well, I guess we stay here then. You know, that might be a technique that would work. I don't know if it's 100% uh, going to prevent swarms. Sometimes those swarms will leave and 
still swarm without a queen. Most of them will go back, but some of them I've seen stay out there and wonder what happened. Um, swarm control is best going to be uh, prevented by you tearing out swarm cells or using techniques like Damari method, um, snail grow boards, um, just uh, tearing out swarm cells is labor intense. Um, I like to make splits. So instead of letting, instead of letting my bees swarm, I, I create a swarm on a controlled environment. I create four uh, resource frames with the mother queen from the parent hive and move them away and make the mother hive uh, raise their own queen again. Cuts down on mites and it helps them uh, not swarm again anytime soon anyway. All right, let's talk about some of these items. Anybody know what this is? Uh, let's see if I can get it in focus here. There, there, there it is. Uh, this device here, I used to live by these. I used to love these so much. I don't like them so much anymore. Let me explain why. This is called a bee escape or porter. P-O-T-T-E-R, fellow that invented it. Porter bee escape. Kind of cool thing because the bees go, um, like if you put this in an inner cover that I don't use, but if you were to put it in your inner cover, that means that you put it, um, you put your inner cover below your honey super. So the inner cover, and then put your uh, honey super that's filled up and sealed off. And the bees that are up there will go into the hole and out this way. And there's two little prongs in there that they can't work their way back in. So all the bees in your honey super that you're ready to harvest will go in and out. And then your honey super will be left there with no bees in it. Now, why that's bad nowadays is because of small hay beetle. They can fit through this and without bees up there, <laughs> that's great. Uh, when the teacher's away, all the beetles are going to play. So I don't use these uh, much anymore, but show and tell time, it's a good thing to know. Also, how about this? Do you know what this is? I'll keep it kind of close where you can see it in focus here. Well, this is sometimes called a hair clip or just a clip for a queen. Like you see your queen walking around, you can go down there and scoop her up. This is used a lot of times by beekeepers that don't want to touch their queen when they're moving her around. So you can hold her in here, put her somewhere else and let her out. Got to be careful, though you'll never really smash her by the, the mouth of the clip. Over here by the edge, these two pieces run real close together. They almost are like scissors. They, they really are. And so right here on the edge, when you close them, if the queen sticks her head in there or abdomen and you close it, it will kill your queen. So a lot of people, including me, do not use these because I have more dexterity over my fingers where I can safely handle my queen. But that is a queen clip. How about this? You know what this is? There's a funny little scope in it. You might have seen this if you've made wine before, although it's different than the ones used for wine and beer. This is a refractometer, and I've made a lot of videos on how to use a refractometer. So I, I buy the little inexpensive ones for $20 or $30. You put a drop of honey on there, close it up, look through here, and it tells you if your honey is ripe to harvest, 18 or 19% moisture level. So these are handy little things if you're not sure whether your um, honey is ready to harvest. How about this one? This is another thing that I live with. I live by, you know what it is? It's a queen pushing cage. You see your queen, you want to cage her in the month of August, September, and October to break the uh, mites brood cycle. Boom, you can just hold your queen in captivity for a week and then let her back out. And that way she won't lay a bunch of eggs so the mites can't reproduce their, during their most uh, reproductive time. Got two more things and then this to show you. Uh, these two things are what? You recognize what these are? Queen cages. Now, there's three queen cages. I don't have the Jay's Bees here, the plastic one, but I want to talk about these two. California mini cage. I don't think a lot of beekeepers see these unless you're running a queen operation. This is what we use in raising queens. This is a three-hole Benton, B-E-N-T-O-N, Benton three-hole cage. Look at the little circles. Uh, that's why we call it a three-hole, one, two, three. And normally when you get this, you'll see this in a package of bees. And one of these circles will be filled with candy under some wax paper. Corks on both ends, as you can see. You always want to remove the cork on the candy side. Let the outside bees eat through it or dig through it to let your queen out slowly on your package of bees. How about this? You know what this is? Mmm. Confusing to some of you? Wow. No, it's not an instrumental insemination uh, machine for queens. I just threw this in there for fun. This is actually, some of you might have guessed it if you're a bicyclist like I am, a cyclist. It's to, I, I need to change out my chain on my bicycle. I've been riding my bike so much this year that my chain is now ready to be replaced. This is a little tool 
that you, you push out the pin, although I have the, the quick release pins, but I got to get a new chain and then size it to my bike. So I'll have to push the pins out and then uh, push them back in to get the right size. So I know I kind of fooled you. It's not beekeeping. Hey, I'm a beekeeper on a bicycle. It qualifies. Come on. Now let's talk about why I got these two frames here. Ultra, ultra important because some of you are new and haven't seen my videos that I've made on this. I did an experiment last year where I put frames in a uh, a hive. I marked them. I wanted to see. So what I did was I actually added wax. I've got a video showing you how I add wax to undrawn foundation, brand new foundation. And then I put it in the hive to see if they would draw it out in one week. And they did. Look at that. Beautiful. So they added, they took the wax that I had on here and they went ahead and drew it out beautifully on both sides. But the one next to it, I had like 10 of those in there. This one actually says, no wax. It was put in the same exact time. This one was right in the middle where they draw out the wax the most. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> so by adding wax to your frames, this is something you need to be doing before you get your bees. And I'll leave a link in the description. No, I'll tell you what. I think I'll leave a link right now, right here, where you can learn how to add wax to your frames. So important to do. I hope you guys will join me for my live stream. If not, see you over here. Let's make some wax frames together.